I will say, uh, finally, if you will allow me, um, some, um, more than one son of dear friends was injured um, fighting to uh, defend the lives of Jews in Israel. And I would like to dedicate uh, our learning together to the Fuash Lema, if you will allow me. All right, and with that. Okay, so uh, just to kind of remind us where we have been one final time. So we began this, as I said, this was, is a an introduction to rabbinic literature course. We began with some theoretical introduction where we spoke about what Agada is and a bit of its history and its reception history. Uh, and then we basically uh, decided to, well, we basically um, went from theory to practice in looking at the story of Yalta the Shrew. We began by looking at uh, notable shrews throughout the Western canon. We defined the archetype and we then did our preliminary reading of the story of Yalta. And we found that at face value, she is a classic shrew and her story is a classic shrew narrative. Um, we had the comedy, we had the scenes of verbal and physical violence, we had the terrified um, and timid husband, and we had the bad-tempered mad woman who didn't get her own way and unleashed her fury at everything in her path. And we asked, as I said, we must always ask when reading the story in the Talmud, is this really the story the Talmud is telling? And I already gave the game away by telling you most probably, almost always the answer to that question is no. And that is because one very important hallmark in rabbinic storytelling is the false front or the story appear to be saying and what they are actually saying are all diametrically opposite, deliberately mislead. Um, and so what we have to do is basically go from the preliminary reading to the actual reading, try and break through the story's false front and tease out the deeper truth that lies hidden between the lines. And that is what all of you attempted to do last week when I sent you off to Chavuta. And I expect um, brilliant insights as a result of that today. And so we began our I put it to you, the Talmudic stories, because of their false fronts, can never just be read. They must always be reread. And so we began our rereading last week when we looked at the rereading of the story of the other mad woman in the attic, and we looked back on Bertha Mason from Jane Eyre. And we spoke about how the shrew really comes about because of the problematic relationship between women and anger, that a woman who is mad is very easily turned into a mad woman all that it takes is for someone to dismiss her as such. And we noted that in our story, Ola dismisses Yalta for being a raging shrew. And I ended last class by asking, is that really who she is? And today is the day we find out. So, as I mentioned two classes ago, to read a story in the Talmud, there are two things we need to do. We need to zoom in and do a close reading of the text, and we need to zoom out and look at the context. And it is with the context that I'd like to begin. Specifically, I'd like to begin with the broad context. Yalta, as, as I mentioned, is the woman most referenced by name in all of the Talmud. She has no fewer than seven references. And so let us begin by looking at some of these other references that we have of Yalta and see if she really is the shrew that Ula accuses her of being. And at this point, I'm about to share my screen, but I do require a reader. So can somebody please volunteer to read? Anita, as ever, thank you very much. For those of you who've taken control of the source sheet on your own, we are looking at source number 23. And Anita, can you please take it away with the first source? Yata once brought some blood to Rabba Barbahana, who informed her that it was impure. She then took it to Rav Yitzchak, son of Rav Yehuda, who told her that it was pure. But how could he act in this manner, seeing that it was taught if a rabbi declared anything impure, another rabbi may not declare it pure? At first, he informed her that it was indeed impure. However, when she told him that every time she brings this kind of blood to Rabbi Rabbi Barbarhana, he declares it pure, but on that but that on the last occasion he had a pain in his eye. Rav Yitzchak gave her his ruling that it was pure. Thank you. So this is a rather complicated story from Tractate Nida, which is all about the laws of menstruation. Uh, what is happening here is that, um, well, some background. Uh, not every kind of spotting, not every kind of blood stain is considered menstrual. There are different kinds of spotting halachically, uh, and only once the blood is actually diagnosed as menstrual blood does the, is the woman considered impure and therefore um, uh, prohibited from having sexual relations with her husband. 
Yalta sees a questionable blood spot and she takes it to Rabba Bar Barkhana to have it diagnosed. I will say parenthetically today, thank God, uh, at least in the um, uh, non ultra orthodox world, uh, there are very um, learned women who do these diagnoses today in place of rabbis. Uh, and Rabbi Baba Khana tells her that it is in fact impure and she is menstrual. Uh, and then Yata does something highly audacious, which you're not strictly speaking meant to do. She seeks a second halachic opinion, which basically is not allowed. We know that once we ask a rabbi a question, we have to abide by that rabbi's ruling. But the Talmud comes down on her side when it explains that Rabbi Baba Khana couldn't see properly. He had some sort of eye problem, and therefore he was incapable of rendering a halachic decision on this matter. I will say uh, that um, scholars who read this story basically say that this story is brought in as a proof text to show that women actually know their bodies best and should be relied upon when it comes to diagnoses concerning their bodies. Um, what can you, let's do this by chat, unless anybody really wants to speak, in which case raise your electronic hand and Evie or I can call on you. Um, what can you tell me about Yata from this story? Sorry. That she was knowledgeable, first of all, that she was very conscientious about her bleeding, that even though every time she had brought a questionable uh, thing to the rabbi, he said it was pure, that didn't mean that she she wouldn't, she kept checking and checking and checking. Um, but also that she was, she was knowledgeable enough to uh, question the first opinion. Very good. So those are two extremely important points, which I see are being echoed in the chat here. First of all, extremely knowledgeable. Let's start with that. When Ola says to her in the story, you're ignorant, you don't know the law, clearly that is incorrect. Yata absolutely knows the law. And second, she respects the law. She very much adheres to the halachic system. Uh, let me see what else is being said here in the chat. She self-confidence. Oh, go ahead. Okay, thank you. No, I'm, I'm good. Um, respectful, traditional, religious, fantastic. She is learned and knows she is right and that she and she's not shy. Good. She's quite assertive. And I would say assertive, but in a very respectful way, as Anita says. Um, a degree of autonomy within the rabbinic hierarchy. That is true. And I would say, Emily, she's able to do that precisely because she knows the system so well. She knows her body, she's confident, um, and she has an understanding of Rabbi Baba Khana's situation, which makes her quite receptive. She could see that something was wrong with Rabbi Baba Khana. Good, fantastic. Um, let's move on. Anita, if you could read one other source for us, please. Yalta said to Rav Nachman, her husband, right? Everything that the Torah prohibited, it permitted a corresponding thing. It prohibited blood. It permitted liver. A menstruating woman, pure blood. The fat of domesticated animals, the fat of wild animals. Pork, the brain of a carp. The marsh hen, the tongue of a fish. A married woman, divorced days in her husband's lifetime. A brother's wife, a leveret bride. A Samaritan woman, a beautiful captive woman. I would like to eat milk and meat. Rav Nachman told the cooks, roast her and utter. Thank you. For every law, says Yalta to Rav Nachman, there is a loophole. We cannot have bloody meat, but we can have liver, which is a naturally bloody piece of meat. We cannot have pork, but we can have a shibuta, is the word in the original. By the way, if any of you are curious about the taste of pork, uh, all you have to do is figure out what a shibuta is and then find one and eat one, because apparently they taste exactly the same. Problem is, we don't know what a shibuta actually is. Um, I want to eat milk and meat. Find me the loophole for that. And Rav Nachman says to the cooks, roast her and udder, which is the halachically permissible way of eating milk and meat. The Talmud in Chulin will tell us that um, if you have an udder and you op op open it up and you let the milk spill out, whatever milk remains seep within the flesh is halachically permissible. So you can all go off and by others to cook for Shabbat. What can you tell me about Yata from this story? She really knows her stuff because yeah. look how many examples she brought. Fantastic. She knows the legal system through and through. There are so many examples that she invokes here. Uh, and as Anita very astutely observes, 
she knows it well enough to push the boundaries. You can only really push the boundaries of a system once you know that system through and through. And she cares about the system enough to remain in it, and yet she's able to push the boundaries. Very knowledgeable and seems to understand the ampening of the system. Very good, fantastic. Uh, she wants to continue to learn. Fantastic. Zella, did I see a hand? She has a playfully respective and mutually, playfully competitive, but mutually respectful relationship with her husband. Fantastic. That was a voice from the void. I didn't quite see a face with that voice, but yes, whoever you are, um, invisible speaker, that is absolutely correct. Um, she has, she does seem to have a deeply mutual, mutually respectful relationship with Rav Nachman. They seem to respect one another and listen to one another. Very good. Let's, uh, Anita, are you sick of reading yet? No. Nope. Please continue to the third source. When the household of the ex lark would afflict Rav Amra the pious, they made him lie down in the snow, yelled to her, and took him into the bathhouse and bathed him till the water of the bathhouse turned the color of blood and his flesh was covered with great spots. Thank you. Which so I totally that's... did not understand. Okay, so let's explain. So when the household, the household is generally understood to mean the servants of the exilarch. The exilarch, to remind you, is the um, leader of the Babylonian Jewish community. When his servants wanted to annoy Rav Amram the pious, excuse me, we're not entirely sure why they had it in for Rav Nachman, Rashi suggests that he was simply annoyingly pious. They make him lie down in the snow and they give him frostbite. Yata hears this and arranges for him to be taken to the bathhouse and gently nursed back to health. What can you tell me about the um, about Yata from this uh, from this story? And yes, Yata, according to general uh, understanding, was in fact the daughter of this exilarch. So she is important in the household. Very good, Anita. Anything else? She's compassionate. She's compassionate. Fantastic. This is a woman who is kind and caring and respectful. Good. Very good. Anything else? So if she's connected to the house of the exilarch, she's in a, she's defying um, what the exilarch wanted to have done, um, or at least it was under their under their roof, you know, the buck stops here kind of thing. Um, and as far as I understand from the Talmud, the Exilarch household in general has had a reputation of kind of being thugs and having thugs out there that would that they could send to do their dirty work. So she's not in sync with that program. Fantastic. Yes, the, um, the household of the Exilarch was in certain generations quite tyrannical. And Yata stands up to that. Laura says co absolutely correctly, she's not afraid. She's quite bravely standing up to the important political institution in the community. Wonderful. So one final story I want to look at. Now, the stories in the Talmud um, very often parallel one another. We will often find stories that kind of act as pairs. Uh, and this story, you'll notice, is an almost direct parallel to our main text in number one. So I'm going to have Anita read it. Anita, one last time, if you wouldn't mind. Um, and as we read it, I want you to look out for the similarities between this story and our main text, um, which is not actually number, our main text about the story of Yalta and Ula. Anita, take it away, please. Uh, the bright spots, I would say, it's it's just, it, I'm not entirely sure what the medicine of the time, why it had it this way, but that was part of the healing process. Rav Nachman said to Rav Yehuda, let Dona come and pour us drinks. Rav Yehuda replied, Shmuel said, one should not make use of a woman. Rav Nachman said, she is a minor. Rav Yehuda replied, Shmuel explicitly said, one should not make use of a woman at all, whether adult or minor. Rav Nachman said, would the master send a greeting to Yalta? Rav Yehuda replied, Shmuel said, a woman's voice is considered indecent. Rav Nachman said, through a messenger. Rav Yehuda replied, Shmuel said, one should not send greetings to a woman. Rav Nachman said, through her husband. Rav Yehuda replied, Shmuel said one should not send greetings to a woman at all. 
His wife sent Rav Nachman a message. Conclude his business and let him go, lest he make you as an ignoramus. Thank you. All right, so a little bit of context here. Rav Yehuda is a really important rabbi, arguably a more senior rabbi to Rav Nachman who lives in another town. At some point, somebody from Rav Nachman's town and somebody from Rav Yehuda's town get into some sort of fight and it doesn't end very well. And Rav Nachman, in response, summons Rav Yehuda to come and appear before his court. Now, Rav Yehuda and this rabbi is inferior to me. I should be going. I should not be summoned by him. On the other hand, he's also the son-in-law of the Exilarch, so maybe I should. So he decides to go, but he's clearly not happy to be there because he passive-aggressively keeps telling Rav Nachman that what he is suggesting contradicts what their teacher, Shmuel, who was the teacher of both of them, taught them. What are the similarities between this story and our main story about Yalta and Ula? Well, the... the um... The back and the, the verbal back and forth is very much the same pattern. So Good. Like, yeah, like, like Yalta and and Rav Nachman, her husband, they, they've got this. They have this method of communication, which is. The, so, so her method of communication is the same as his, and they're they they both know how to joust in in this halachic uh, courtyard. <laughs> So I would say most of the jousting here is between Rav Yehuda and Rav Nachman. But yes, there is this back and forth uh, in both stories. Uh, in both stories, Laura points out she's kind of, you kind of imagine her eavesdropping at the door. In both cases, there is a guest who shows up to the Rav Nachman Yalta household. In both cases, Rav Nachman requests that the guest acknowledge Yalta, the lady of the house. And in both cases, the guest cites a higher halachic authority with more exclusionary views of women refusing to do so. We don't acknowledge the woman. We don't send her a blessing or we don't send her a cup of wine. So two very similar stories, two diametrically opposite responses on Yalta's part. Notice how in this case, she doesn't break anything. She doesn't curse anyone. She doesn't throw any tantrums. She simply tiptoes over to her husband and whispers in his ear, get rid of him. He's embarrassing you. What can you tell me about Yalta from this final source? She has a lot of respect for her husband. She doesn't like the way he's being treated. Good. Good. She's extremely, and to echo what Anita just wrote, yes, she's protective of Rav Nachman and his honor. She's looking out for his respect. And so emerging from all of these other stories that we have of Yalta, we have a portrait of a lady who is extremely knowledgeable, adheres to the halachic system. Uh, what else did we say? Um, um, has a good relationship with her husband, is kind and compassionate, very, as we said, um, um, tactful in pursuing her aims, and highly concerned with her husband's honor. So hardly your typical shrew. And so now that we have a bit of a deeper understanding about Yalta, and that is why it is so important to read these stories within their broad context. If you want to understand a character in rabbinic stories, find other stories about that same character, because that will enrich your understanding of who this person is. The next thing we need to do is zoom in a little bit and look at the immediate context, the place in the Talmud where the story appears. We can learn a great deal, as I've said, about the stories of the Talmud from the way the rabbis choose to frame them, from how they appear within the Talmudic discourse. And so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to read the framing passage of our story, what appears our story. It is a discussion, a halachic discussion of this cup of blessing, what we need to do with this particular cup. Uh, Laura, would you read 24 for us, please? Just take your time. Yes, yeah, I, I couldn't. Um, 24. Ten things have been said in connection with the cup of blessing. It needs to be rinsed and washed, undiluted and full. It requires adorning and wrapping. He takes it up with both hands and places it in his right in the right hand, and he raises it a hand breadth from the ground and fixes his eyes on it. Some add that he sends it round to the members of his household. 
he sends it round to the members of his household so that his wife may be blessed. Thank you. And directly after that, we have the story of Yalta and Ula. What can you tell me about the story from the way the rabbis choose to frame it? Yalta should have been included. Good. Absolutely <laughs> correct. It appears that sending the cup round to other members of the household and to the wife specifically was standard halachic practice, and Yata was absolutely right to expect it. I will say parenthetically that within the course of this Talmudic discussion, there is another list of things that we do with this cup, and it's only three items long, much shorter than the 10 item list we have here. And that we are told is a list that was used in Israel. So it seems that in Israel, in fact, women were not sent the cup. But in Babylon, they were. And the Babylonian editors of the Babylonian Talmud were absolutely on Yalta's side. And there's, underlying our story is a bit of a political conflict between the rabbinic center in Israel and the rabbinic center in Babylon, who clearly are doing things differently. Uh, and in Judaism, absolutely correct, Anita, household does mean wife, uh, which is very interesting and implies something about how the rabbis saw the woman and her place in the household. I discuss this extensively in the final chapter of my book. Um, the other thing, let's now, we've, we've seen how the rabbis open the story. Let's see how they close the story. I'm going to go back to our main story in number 18. You can learn a lot again about where the rabbis stand, the rabbinic storytellers, by who they choose to give the final word to. So who gets the last word in our story? Yalta. Yalta does. Notice how the men do all the talking throughout the story, but it is Yalta significantly who is given the final word. And that too implies that the rabbinic storytellers were completely on Yalta's side. So we've read the story in the broad context on which we have deduced that Yalta apparently was not a taller shrew. And we read the story in its immediate context in which we deduced that, at least according to the people telling us the story, the rabbinic storytellers, Yalta is right. And now that we know this, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to zoom in and we're going to reread the story. And this time we're going to do it from the point of view of the woman herself. Um, as opposed to true narratives, we're going to try and get into true narratives, as I mentioned, are always told from the point of view of the husband, not the wife. This time, we're going to try and do it from the point of view of the wife. Uh, Emily, I see you have a question. So that's a really good question, Emily. I believe I touched upon this, but if not, this is a good time to mention it. There are different interesting relationships between the halakhic discussion and the stories that follow them. So a story will sometimes amplify or illustrate a certain point in the halakhic discussion. Sometimes it will add a point that was not mentioned in the halakhic discussion, and sometimes it will go as far as to contradict a halakhic discussion. In this case, it does seem that the story is there to simply amplify the point that you do send the cup to your wife. Um, all right, so uh, Laura, would you reread number 18 for us, and then we will um, actually, you know, before we reread, um, I asked you last class to uh, break the story down into acts or scenes. So by chat, how many people, how many acts did you break the story into? Three. I think that is absolutely correct. And, and you'll notice because I am, um, that is how I broke it down on the page. Uh, it does not appear quite like this in the Talmud. It's just one block. Um, so let's do this. Um, act one, where does act one take place? In the first paragraph. I asked you to look at the setting. At the dinner table, correct, in, um, in Av Nachman and Yalta's house. Um, act two, where does it take place? In the wine, okay, good, Laura. So it's the it's actually the wine store, meaning the storage of the wine. It wasn't actually the cellar. 
it probably was, you know, more or less on ground value, but it was where the wine was stored. The wine house would be a better way of calling it good. Um, and where does Act 3 take place? Back at the table. Good. Um, so that is the setting. The next thing I ask you to look for is the characters. So who are the characters at, in Act 1? Uh, so I would say that is almost correct, Laura. Yalta isn't actually there in Act 1. It's Rav Nachman and Ula. Good. Uh, who are the characters in Act 2? Yalta, good. And who are the characters in Act 3? All three characters, fantastic. So if I were to break the story down, and this is basically what I do in the book, and this is basically what you should do as a first step if you're reading a story in the Talmud, is just map the whole thing out according to structure, setting, and characters, and you will have something like this. I just put it in the chat. Um, the act, where it takes place, and then the characters. Um, so that's absolutely correct, Anita, but that is really more about the context. Now we're just looking at what is happening on the stage. Uh, and you'll notice, as I mentioned uh, two classes ago, the story takes place in a very confined setting. It's not a big space or a big time. Uh, and it has just three characters and they interchange from one act to the next. So very much like a small three person play. And now that we have this structure mapping in mind, let us go back and reread the story. Uh, again, we said that our close reading has to be structure, setting characters. And the two things that we have left is plot and then themes, motifs, and symbols. And those are the things we're going to look at next. So Laura, take it away, please. Ola was once at the house of Rav Nachman. He had a meal, said the grace after meals, and handed the cup of blessing to Rav Nachman. Rav Nachman said to him, Master, Please send the cup of blessing to Yalta. Ola responded, So said Rabbi Yochanan, the fruit of a woman's body is blessed only from the fruit of a man's body, as it is written, he will bless the fruit of your body, Deuteronomy. It does not say the fruit of her body, but the fruit of your body. Meanwhile, Yalta heard. Okay, let's just stop you. Sorry, stop you there. That is the end of Act One, and let's try and unpack Act One. As we said, Ula is at the house of Rav Nachman. He's given the honor of leading the blessing after the meal. He drinks on the cup of blessing. Rav Nachman drinks. He says to Ula, please send the cup to my wife and acknowledge her. And Ula explains how actually women do not drink from this cup because the blessing in the cup, generally believed to be the blessing of childbirth, is transmitted to the woman through her husband. And it is enough that the husband drink and be blessed. Now, I want to claim that this as opposed to how it is usually read by other scholars, notably feminist scholars, this is not just a sexist attempt to exclude women from the cup of blessing. And to understand why, again, we have to zoom out and read the story in context. And this time I want to look at the historical context, because if we read this story within the context of the ancient world and ancient biology, We'll notice that what we'll understand that the claim that Ula is making here is anchored in basic biological fact. So let's zoom out and look at the historical context and talk about reproduction in antiquity. For most of the ancient world, the power of procreation belonged exclusively to man. It was man who created life out of the generative force of his seed whereas woman was merely a human incubator who carried that life inside of her. Laura, can I please ask you to read number 25? She who is called the, am I, okay. She who is called the mother is not her offspring's parent, but nurse to the newly sown embryo. The male who mounts begets, the female, a stranger, guards. Thank you. And, and one more, and this is Aristotle, one of the great biologists on the ancient world. <laughs> Male is that which is able to concoct, to cause to take shape, and to discharge, 
semen possessing the principle of the form. Female is that which receives the semen, but is unable to cause semen to take shape or to discharge it. Thank you. So man created life through his seed, whereas woman was a vessel or a receptacle to hold that seed inside of her womb. The womb itself in Greco-Roman biological writings is likened to an upside down jar lying inside the woman's body, hollow and waiting to be filled. Um, and again, this is, you find this in Greco-Roman writings, but these writings have a direct influence onto rabbinic writings who see procreation and the woman's body in very much the same way. Laura, could you please read number 26? A woman makes a covenant only to the one who made her a vessel. Woman has more storeroom than the man, wider at the bottom and narrower at the top so that it could receive embryos genesis that is the womb basically an upside down jar a receptacle to hold man's seed and so in light of this understanding of procreation what ulla says makes perfect sense man is the primary agent of childbirth and he alone should be blessed for it woman is ancillary at best and so she will receive the blessing of childbirth once she receives the man's blessed seed into the vessel that is her womb. And in light of that, let's please continue to act two. Are you good to continue reading, Laura? Sure. Thank you. Meanwhile. Meanwhile, Yalta heard, and she got up in a passion and went to the wine storehouse and broke 400 jars of wine. Thank you. I am going to claim that this is no temper tantrum. This is not Yata breaking all those jars of wine out of jealous spite. If I can't have wine, no one can have wine. This is a very clever, very sophisticated response to the biological argument that Ulla has just made. Vessels are unimportant, are they? Okay. Let's see how you do without vessels. I'm not going to touch the wine. I'm just going to deconstruct the vessels. And if vessels are so unimportant, it shouldn't make any difference now, should it? Let's read on to Act 3. Rav Nachman said to him, let the master send her another cup. <clears throat> he sent it to her with a message. All that wine can be counted as a blessing. Thank you. Let's stop here. Um, although we're not quite at the end of Act 3. So Ola says, please send another cup to my wife. And yeah, I'm sorry, Rav Nachman says, please send another cup to my wife. And Ola agrees and sends it to her with a message, all the wine is equally blessed. Now, again, I'm going to claim that there is some serious subtext here. Because if Ola genuinely believed that all the wine is equally blessed, he would have said that the first time that Rav Nachman asked him to send Yah to the cup. But Ulla understands perfectly well the message that Yalta has just tried to send him. And he responds in kind. And we can understand what is really being argued over if we try and uncover, and this is the fifth element of our close reading, the symbols in the story. So there are two main symbols in the story. I asked you to look out for them in Chavuta. Can anyone tell me what they are and what they symbolize? So we have the vessels, whether it's the wine goblet or the wine vessels. We have the wine, which is representative of the semen. We also have the number 400. So 400, um, so, okay, let's start with that. 400 is simply a standard um, number of rabbinic hyperbole. When the rabbis want to make the point that there was a lot, they will usually go to 400. But yes, you're absolutely correct. Yes. <laughs> but it also, uh, it's Yalta's name adds up to 400. And the word emet, truth, is also 400. So Yalta and emet are intertwined. Did you go searching for Gematria, Anita? <laughs> I found it in the commentary. Good for you. Kala yeah. Kavad for looking at the commentary. Um, yes, uh, you can all learn a thing or two from Anita here. Uh, Sui. Yep. No, I, I just wanted to mention that um, the number 400, aside from being what you said it is in the Talmud, is the same thing in the Tanakh. Like uh, we just, Abraham buys the stay Efron Hachiti for 400 shekel and, um, and uh, 
Esav comes to greet Yaakov with 400 men and David HaMelech walks around 400 men. So it's, I just wanted to add that to the 400 comment. I love how brilliant and knowledgeable all my students always are. This is such a pleasure. Absolutely correct. Yes. By the way, generally, if you want to understand a lot about rabbinic storytelling, it helps to know that the thing, so if you want to ask, if you ask why an author writes in a particular way, the first question to ask is what are they reading? The rabbis are reading Bible. So it should not at all surprise us that the same um, um, stylings and the same um, poetics that we find in biblical storytelling then come up again in rabbinic storytelling. Uh, but I'm gonna go back to what Anita said earlier because I realize that we're running out of time and um, I actually have to be on a plane I have to be at an airport about half an hour once this class is done and Evie has to go and manage another class. So we're gonna to have to end quite tightly on the hour. Again, I have put my email in the chat. Um, I invite you, if there's anything that remains lingering after this class is done to please email me and I will respond. I'm gonna go back to Anita's point. The two symbols in the story, absolutely correct, are the vessel, which symbolizes the woman's womb and the wine, which symbolizes the man's seed. By saying to Yata, all the wine is equally blessed, you do not have to drink from this particular cup, Ula is doubling down. Yes, vessels are not important. They're interchangeable. The only thing that is important is what is inside the vessel, i.e. the wine, i.e. man's seed. And yes, procreation absolutely is a male act. Um, Laura, would you finish off, please? Rav, Rav Nachman said to him, oh, he said this, uh, let the master send her another cup. He sent it to her with a message. All that wine can be counted as a blessing. She returned answer. Gossip comes from peddlers and lice from rags. Thank you. So now that we've zoomed out and we've looked at the story in its historical context and we've zoomed in and we found the two symbols of the story, and we realize that actually the subtext of the story is a biological debate over procreation, we can understand this final line in a way that scholars have not. And this is why doing this with the stories, doing this close and contextual reading is so important. Gossip comes from peddlers and lice from rags. Once again, this is not a torrent of abuse on Yata's part. This is a continuation of the biological argument. And once again, to understand this, we're going to zoom out again and look at the historical context because within ancient biology, lice were believed to spontaneously generate. You do not need a father louse and a mother louse to create a little baby louse. They were simply born out of the air, which is why I think we have this on the source sheet. According to one opinion in the Talmud, there you go. It is, uh, this is number 27. Uh, it is permissible to kill lice on Shabbat since, quote, they do not procreate, meaning they're not a real animal. They are simply born out of the air. Remove women from the procreative process, says Yalta to Ula, and you might be able to generate lice. You might be able to reproduce gossip. But for any real act of procreation, you need both female and male vessel and seed. Women may be vessels, but they are no less essential to the creation of life. And so now that we've reread the story of Yata, we find that it is very far from how we had read it initially. This is not a petty fight over a cup of wine. This is a principal debate over the power of procreation. This is not an outburst of verbal and physical violence. This is a highly intelligent argument in favor of women's reproductive worth. And this is not a shrew storming off in a tantrum. This is a rational, self-possessed woman who stays and fights the system from within. And this final point for me is Yalta at her most remarkable. Notice how at no point does Yalta say, I am not a vessel. The dominant biological tradition of her time said that women were vessels and Yalta accepts that. But within that tradition, Yalta tries to carve out a space for herself. Yes, women may be vessels, but vessels are critically important. 
As such, Yata for me is the ideal reader, and it is her strategy that I adopt in the book as I read the stories of the six named heroines of the Talmud. Because not every tradition that we find in the Talmud is going to sit well with our 21st century feminist sensibilities. Some of them may strike us as difficult, so as not to say jarring, forgive the pun. And the point is not to dismiss these traditions, but rather like Yata to accept them as our own and try and carve out a space for ourselves within them. And if we do so, we might just find, as we just did with the story of Yalta, that these traditions are not as far from what we believe in after all. I'm going to make one final point and then I will open for questions. Because the ultimate moral of the story of Yalta, I'm going to claim, is an ethical one. The final question I asked for you to look out for in Chavuta last week is, what I call on this sheet and in the book, well, I call it um, axiology or the moral of the story. I mentioned how the stories of the Talmud are not historical. They are educational. They are there to teach us a certain moral or religious lesson. And the final question I wanted you to ask yourselves is why are the rabbis even telling us the story? And I mentioned in the book that when the rabbis tell the story of a woman, nine times out of 10, they are telling the story of an other with a capital O. And that through these stories, they convey moral messages about how to treat the others in our midst. And so the ultimate lesson of the story of Yalta, I contend, is this. <clears throat> Ula dismisses Yalta for being a raging shrew. And so do generations of readers after him who never bother to look at the story more closely or from her point of view. And dismissal, as we've seen, is the worst kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. <clears throat> Katerina, who we read about two weeks ago, said, if I be waspish, best beware my sting. Treat me like a snarling, scratching, biting shrew, and I will be a snarling, scratching, biting shrew. Shylock, another famous Shakespearean other said, thou callest me dog before thou hadst a cause, but since I am a dog, beware my fangs. Treat me like a heartless Jew monster, and I will be a heartless Jew monster, and I will demand my pound of flesh. <clears throat> we saw how Bertha Mason was mocked for being crazy until she was, in fact, driven mad. And in the Midrash, the rabbis tell us the story of Timna. Timna is mentioned in the book of Genesis. But the rabbis expand her story, and they tell us that she was a Horite princess who more than anything wanted to convert and join the Jewish people. But our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, dismiss her as unworthy. And so Timna goes off and gives birth to Amalek, arch enemy of the Jewish people. <clears throat> dismiss someone as irrational or wicked or unworthy, and they will become the very thing you dismiss them for. This is a moral mistake very few of us avoid. We saw how men, through the archetype of the shrew, will sometimes dismiss women, but adults dismiss children all the time. We dismiss people whose culture we do not immediately understand. And these days, we dismiss just about anyone who doesn't see things exactly the same way we do. And so the next time you're about to dismiss someone, pause and think of Yalta of how unfairly she was dismissed and give that person a hearing. You may not end up agreeing with them and that's fine, but at least you will not have created another mad woman in the attic. And that ladies and gentlemen is all I have to say. We have about eight minutes and I am happy to open up for questions, comments, protests, insights, anything you'd like to share. You can use, uh, Sandra, hi, yes. You okay. want to unmute yourself yeah. or are you going? Yeah, Thank hi. You. So amazing and wonderful. Thank you, Gila. So Thank I have you. a question, maybe a meta question, but a question. Um, we understand that the um, rabbis from Eretz Israel and the Yerushalmi Talmud accepted Agadah um, more readily. I mean, that's an understatement. Then the rabbis of the Talmud Basli. 
I mean, there are Gemaras written about the ignorance of rabbis who don't consider Agadah, and yet those are Yerushalmi rabbis who say that, and then the Balvli rabbis as a whole, um, let's say they, they look at scans at it, or they'll look at it if they have to, if they have to use it to interpret the halacha. How do, how does your methodology, which I am totally working on ingraining into myself, how does this methodology take into account the real diametric differences between accepting agada on the one hand and working with it as it gives us insight and on the other hand dismissal of agada and i've taught for you know 20 years longer and i've had people stand up in lectures that i've given say how can you rely on agada i mean i've had men do that i don't know whether they expected me to start to cry or to walk up the stage but that those were those days i mean it's two and a half decades worth of stuff that's nothing in the in the world how do we deal with that how do you how does your paradigm deal with that and how do you deal with that so that's a really good question and probably a longer one than i have time to answer in depth okay. i will say uh, i'll try and answer it to the best of my ability and i will say that i i deal with this extensively in the introduction to the book because because yes, Agada has had, we Jews have had a very tricky relationship to Agada throughout our history. So I'll say very briefly this, um, both the rabbis in Israel and the rabbis in Babylon um, give place of pride to Agada. For, for the rabbis of the rabbinic period, there was halacha and there was agada, and they were different in significant ways, and I explain in the book exactly how, but agada was not considered less important. Not at all. It's true that the Israelis kind of had Agadah in different books, whereas the Babylonians put everything into their Talmud. But essentially, both groups of rabbis did see Agadah as significant, not halachically significant, but morally, spiritually, ethically significant. Mm -hmm. um, when we move past the rabbinic period into the Geonic period, that is when Agadah becomes problematized. And again, I explained in the book exactly why Agadah starts making Jews so uncomfortable in the post-Rabbinic period. And I explain how, what the response was to this sense of discomfort. But the main thing that Jews did, other than try and explain away these stories, um, is to ignore these stories. And you find that for most of Jewish history, these stories were not commented on by the main commentaries, not extensively, and were not studied in the yeshivas. And again, I explained in the book what made the switch in the late 20th and early 21st century, where now there's an explosion in the study of Agadah. Um, and in a way, we're kind of returning to the rabbinic period where we appreciate Agadah. And I, I say in the book, and again, this is, I'm sorry, I keep referring to the book. I just don't have time to say everything that no, I want to say. And it's all actually there. Um, yeah. But um, we, part of the reason Agadah has made Jews throughout history uncomfortable is that it's so radical in place. Mm -hmm. It's so radical, it's so subversive in a way that halakha very often is not. Mm. Um, and so Jews did not quite know what to do with that. Today, in the 21st century, with postmodern culture, we are regaining a radical, subversive spirit. And so we are the first Jews throughout history who are able to read these stories with the same subversive spirit with which they were originally composed, which makes ah really exciting to be on a goddess yeah. today well thank you to you well many greater than i uh but i try and do my part thank you Sandra. thank you thank you so much yes thank you thank you um anything else sorry no i just wanted to add one one thing that i a self-deprecating thing that i found humorous someone recommended to me a book called the daughters of yalta and I assumed that it was Yalta from the Talmud, and this was going to be a series kind of like the Daughters of Rashi, that she had daughters, and there would be legends about her daughters. And of course, it turned out to be that the three three women who attended the Yalta conference during <laughs> at the end of World War II, um, the daughter of Churchill, the daughter of um, uh, Roosevelt, and the daughter of Avril Harriman. And those were the daughters of Yalta. And it's a wonderful book, by the way, but it was not the book I expected it to be. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yes, often, you know, when I teach about Yalta, people are like, oh, Yalta, like the conference. And no, our Yalta was there first. Um, <laughs> anything else? Uh, Emily? 
scholars um, view this uh, as a, um, uh, not this story, but another one of the stories, I, I, um, as a an assertion that women, the rabbinic um, feeling that women could have um, authority and autonomy, that women knew their own bodies best. Can you tell us where that, which scholars are working yes, on? Yes, yes, that um, is in a brilliant book, a dense book, but a brilliant book by Charlotte von Robert. Oh. Von Robert, F-O-N-R-O-B-E-R-T, called Menstrual Purity, and it is all about this tractate. And not surprisingly, she, she looks quite closely at the story of Yalta. It's a dense, theory-laden book, but it's well worth your time if you're interested in it. Because it, it's, it reminded me, I, I can't remember her name, there's um, a sociologist at Rutgers who studies the ultra-Orthodox communities in Jerusalem, who also actually finds that the women in those communities within the medical establishment are granted that autonomy. Even the doctors and even rabbis to some degree grant them that, that they take, they assert that autonomy and authority over their own bodies, and it seems to be accepted. So 100%, uh, uh, Evie, Susanna asked if you could please put the book again in the chat box, so that would be great. Um, and yes, and Emily, the reason for that goes back to the Talmud, because we find that already there. Uh, Laura, very quickly, and then we have to close. So I've taken a couple versions of this class, and it's been... Um, really amazing and learn something new each time. Um, and I'm wondering if you're working on something else now. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to respond to um, Susanna's comment. I'm just going to put the surname of the author in the... Um, um, so yes, this book uh, was always written to be the first of a trilogy. I'm now beginning to work on the next book. Uh, it will be about rabbinic stories because that's the only thing I can do really. Uh, but I think, as it's very early days, that's probably all I'm going to say at this stage. Uh, but Laura, you will be the first to know when when there's anything to know. Thank you so much, Gila. And thank you to everyone who participated and is always part of our learning community. Uh, as always, all the uh, listings of the classes and the signups are open at drisha.org slash classes. And um, we will see each other again soon. Thank you again, Gila, and Lehitraot.